I am David Lormore, and this talk is titled Tired of Rest, an intro to GraphQL. Uh, it's by me. I've got a couple of my friends in the slides that you'll see. Uh, first off, shout out to, uh, I believe it was Kim for that first presentation. As somebody who just got into development in the last few years uh, and had to go through a lot of those struggles on my own, uh, I, I really appreciate her confidence to come out here and share some of those struggles with the developer community and, and relate some of the things to folks that may have been doing this for 10 or 15 years and, you know, have kind of forgotten what it's like to be a brand new developer and trying to get, you know, on this awesome ride that is the, the tech industry and the web industry and everything, you know, it's, it's tough to get involved, but when you do, it's, it's an awesome experience. And so if we can find ways to bring more folks into our community, I think we all win for it. So anyways, to jump right into this, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a developer at an agency in Birmingham, Alabama called Kyan Creative. Uh, we do all kinds of branding and marketing and websites and web apps and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I'm kind of helping out with all of it. And it's, uh, it's a good time. Uh, if you want to find me on the internet, uh, I'm David Lormore. L-O-R-M-O-R, -O -O pretty much everywhere on the web. So you can just kind of like Google that and you will find stuff about me. Hopefully nothing that I don't want you to know about me. Um, anyways, uh, so let's jump right into it. So here we go. Neil, Neil, Do Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to kick us off. And let's look at what the heck is GraphQL anyways. How many people in here have actually heard about what GraphQL is. Awesome. I see a few hands coming up. So somebody's going to be able to at least follow along. There's a lot of like super technical uh, kind of uh, implementation level stuff in this talk and hopefully I don't bore you to tears with it. Um, so to jump right into it, let's look at the history of what GraphQL is. So GraphQL is an open source uh, protocol, so to speak, that came out of Facebook. Uh, Facebook has actually been working on this technology for a little over three years now. I was open sourced about six months ago, back in June or July of last year. Um, but it is actually a very stable technology in that they've been using it in production. Uh, it actually came out of the challenges that they were having with deploying HTML, HTML5 apps to mobile platforms. So. I don't know if any of you guys remember the god-awful experience that used to be Facebook on your iOS device or your Android device. So they obviously knew about it. This is how they fixed it, or part of how they fixed it, and moved from HTML5-based apps to native applications. Um, it powers most of the data exchange that takes place on Facebook's mobile apps, and I believe a good portion of their web app as well is powered by GraphQL at this point. Uh, it's also the communication layer for Relay, which is uh, React plus GraphQL and some other niceties involved there. But uh, if you guys are doing React, or I'm sure you've heard about React, like this is kind of a big deal in that same way. So why is it a big deal? Uh, what, what is it uh, as far as a technology? Um, so it's basically a string-based query language. So if you think, if you've ever written SQL before, you know, you take these, you construct these strings that tell you what you want out of the database, and you send that to your database server, and it sends you back a chunk of data. So GraphQL is that same mindset, but you're communicating over HTTP, primarily via HTTP post requests. So you're actually posting this string to your web server, and it's taking that string, parsing it out, and constructing the data that you need on your front end, whether it's Ember, Angular, React, some cludged up jQuery abomination, uh, whatever it is, it, it, uh, it returns exactly the data that you need. We'll get into a little bit more about what that is and, and how it works. Uh, and the responses are returned in JSON. So a lot of this should seem you know, somewhat familiar. If, if you've dealt with a lot of client server interaction, uh, I think it'll be very easy for you to see why this is a good thing. So what's the big deal? Uh, so here's an example of what GraphQL looks like. And this is probably way too small for you guys in the back to see. But if you look, 
uh, just just a, if you can see a general outline here, uh, we've got a request on this side, and our request looks like your typical kind of JSON structure, except it's missing the values. It, it looks like just a bunch of keys separated into some sort of object structure. And then on this side, you've got your response. And if you kind of notice, like, the request looks like the response. Uh, and this is intentional. So uh, your request, you're basically building the data structure that your front end or your server that's talking to this other server through some sort of API, that it, it's telling it the structure that it wants and the pieces of data that it wants to get back from that server. And it gets that from the server in the structure that it asks, asks for. And I think if you see that, you're probably going, oh, okay, this kind of, this simplifies things a whole lot. If you've ever dealt with REST APIs and hitting multiple URL endpoints and whatnot, you're going to see this makes a whole lot of sense. So, keep losing my mouse, but not bad, right? <laughs> uh, but wait, we've got REST, you know, that's, that's, a good thing. Why should we change? Like everybody kind of uses that at this point. So let's look at it, what some of the weaknesses of REST are. Um, for one, we've got fetching complicated auto object graphs gets unwieldy, unwieldy very quick. So what does that mean? Uh, basically, let's say I want to get a user, but I also want to get the user's friends and I want to get the user's uh, profile picture and, and a list of their interests and, you know, a bunch of other associated data. With a typical REST interface, you're, you're going to have to make multiple AJAX requests acro across the wire in order to uh, build that object up on your front end. There's a whole lot of work and then you're kludging together some sort of J uh, JSON structure into what your app needs to consume to like, all you're trying to do is just output a list of users on the front end with their interests. And you go through this whole ceremony of, like, sending AJAX requests, requests across the wire. And if you've ever done mobile development, you know that mobile devices are not partic particularly good at sending concurrent requ requests at the same time. So all of a sudden your app slows down and everything gets nasty. Um, the other thing you can do is you can keep your... Uh, your uh, your uh, endpoints uh, customized to what those users need, but inevitably you start to get different users consuming those endpoints, and those different users need different things, and so you end up with this this endpoint for a user that's serving up this gigantic JSON object of everything that ever existed in your app about that user and now you're on the front end having to parse through all that data and figure out exactly what pieces you need to once again you're just trying to serve up a list of users with their interests in my example uh, and so if you've ever dealt with that 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 way is kind of nasty too if you think back to the the previous slide you, you're going okay wait I can just tell it I need the user I need their name and I need the list of interests um, so also, uh, like I mentioned, the growing payloads as an application evolves and resources get, bloating, get bloated. So that's back to the idea of you, you start having to hit multiple endpoints to build up the data that your, your front-end client or your uh, server that's consuming some sort of API data uh, needs to, to do what it's going to do. Um, there's also the idea of weak typing. You'll see in a minute, GraphQL is a strongly typed system, which us as Ruby developers, we're all kind of probably shuddering, <laughs> God, strong types. That's why I write Ruby, because I hate strong types and, and, uh, and non-dynamic types and, and all those types of things. And so, um, so you're probably thinking, oh, God, this is not good. But hold out. You'll see it's, it is good stuff. Um, and so the weak, the weak typing means there's not a whole lot that you can infer from the structure of your data uh, and what you're going to get. And you'll see there's some really cool tools around GraphQL that use the strong typing to its advantage so that you can do really awesome things kind of just out of the box without a whole lot of uh, setup or coding and things just work. And we like things that work. 
Uh, and then finally, systems tend to, have to devolve into ad hoc endpoints, coupling, coupling data to a specific view, so to speak. And so uh, that's kind of technical sounding, but basically the longer your REST API lives in production and starts to try and meet the needs of all these different uh, clients that are consuming it, things just get gross and you don't want to write code anymore. So let's, let's get into GraphQL and what, what the principles are of GraphQL. Basically, GraphQL is not a library. It's not a, uh, a Ruby gem or a, uh, uh, an executable that you install in your system. It's more of a, a definition of a protocol that you use. And then we have implementations in uh, various languages, so Ruby. Uh, JavaScript, Elixir, uh, pretty much anything you can imagine. So what is GraphQL all about? Uh, so there's kind of two aspects to what GraphQL is. One, it's inherently structured. So uh, basically this is, has to do with the way GraphQL works. Uh, it's hierarchical, structured, arbitrary code, uh, it's strongly typed, and it uh, the code that it provides is introspective. It's also uh, client oriented. So all the driving force behind what uh, has led to the, the actual implementation of Graph, GraphQL is uh, uh, focused on ensuring that the, the client can consume the data that's uh, hosted on your server in an efficient, easy to use way. So it's product centric, it's client, it has client specific queries. So if you think back to the, the example request I showed you, uh, that the client defines the data that they want. They don't just hit an, a URL endpoint that is just gonna give them whatever data is available on that endpoint. It's backwards compatible. That's always a good thing for you know, legacy clients and being able to make changes moving forward. And it's an application layer protocol. So we'll dive into some of this because you're probably like, oh God, <laughs> what is this guy talking about? We're never inviting him back from Birmingham. <laughs> so it's hierarchical. Uh, what does that mean? I'm sure many of y'all have ever done abstract, abstract syntax trees or uh, lists of data. You understand what this means. So um, in terms of GraphQL, um, it means that all of your data is structured in a way that uh, you can consume the related data of an object through the parent object. So once again, thinking back to the example request, I can define a user and then I can say, well, I know a user has a list of interests. And so I can tell it that I want that list of interests I also know a user has friends, and so that I can tell it that I want the friends out of that uh, for that particular uh, user. And it, it's structured in such a way that if you've ever written JSON or really any sort of kind of structured objects in, in Ruby, if you're, you're writing a, a struct or whatever, it's, it's that same kind of uh, mindset. So structured arbitrary code, that sounds crazy. Uh, <laughs> but basically, um, it basically means that uh, all the code uh, is built in a specific structure on the, on the server, and the server defines uh, code about how to implement the different uh, objects within uh, God, I'm rambling. Uh, within your, your different pieces of data that get served up. Um, and so, so basically, uh, the, this is kind of the hardest one to explain. I always get stuck here. But uh, it allows you to expose kind of the entire surface area of your data in a way that doesn't require a lot of uh, finagling with implementation details and whatnot. If, if you build your, uh, your query objects in a particular way, 
uh, things should just work. So, and we'll get into a little bit more of that when we see some actual code. Um, so strongly typed. Uh, we'll let this guy do his thing for a second because he is strong. And so, like I said, <laughs> as Ruby developers, I know most of us are thinking strongly typed, oh God, <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? Uh, but I think the way that GraphQL does its strong typing is, is actually a, a really good thing because uh, one, it allows you to validate uh, everything within your system before anything gets executed. So as long as your types are defined properly, any sort of query you can throw at your GraphQL server is just going to work. Uh, and it's done in such a way that uh, writing these types is not challenging. I think I've got a question here. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know how much you know about the type systems, but you're seeing to be describing the static type system. Um, strong weak typing are different than what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. These actually strongly typed dynamic. Strongly typed dynamic. Right, right. So, so the, the strong typing is you, let's see, and I write a lot of Ruby and a lot of JavaScript, so like I'm not great at this part. Um, but basically, I, yeah. Right. So it looks like a dynamic system because everything is an object, but in reality, unless you're duct typing properly, different objects are not going to behave like each other. And that's probably type of Yeah. Um, I'm just saying that you're describing static typing. You're calling it strong typing. You're calling it strong typing. Okay. It, you're saying in this description here? Okay. Well, I, I <laughs> full disclaimer, I pulled this directly from the GraphQL implementation description. So, <laughs> like I said, I'm not an expert on the subject, but they refer to it as, as uh, strong typing. In that, in that you have specific uh, types. It's, it doesn't have to do with, I know, I know what you're saying as far as statically typing means once an object is created, it is that object. And this is, this is referring to the fact that you're going to have uh, specific types that are, uh, how do I put this, like they're only implemented as that type, and I think as we get into some of the code, you'll see what I mean. Once again, full disclaimer, I'm not the expert on this part of it. <laughs> um, but I think as you see the system, you'll see the, the advantages over just serving up typical Ruby objects in some sort of hash structure that uh, really has no guarantees about the data that is, that get served up as far as whether it's going to be a string or a, an array or some sort of more defined type for your system. Uh, but anyways, thank you for the input. Um, so it's introspective. Thanks, Oprah. Uh, so GraphQL is introspective. So what this basically means is that um, it allows you to uh, uh, reason about certain things within your system based on the the structure of your data and the structure of the system that you build uh, and so uh, to one point it's it's a uh, a useful paradigm when it comes to statically typed languages like Swift Objective-C in uh, Java because it allows you to uh, kind of in the same vein of being strongly typed, have certain guarantees about your system and, and know about the data that you're going to get before you actually make a request and, and hope that it's going to fit the needs of the client that's consuming that data. So it's product centric. What does this mean? Uh, so GraphQL is unapologetically driven by the requirements of views and the front end, front end engineers that write them. So like I mentioned before, GraphQL wants to make your, uh, your data model as easily accessible from a client perspective as possible. So 
whenever possible, it wants to allow the client to dictate the data that they need to consume rather than allowing the server to dict dictate that, hey, you hit this endpoint and this is the data that you're going to get and good luck figuring it out. Uh, if you've ever written a lot of like heavy front end, you know, Angular, Ember, those types of systems, you know that like trying to fudge together some random API into the data that you need can be a challenge. So client specific queries, once again, kind of the same vein. Uh, GraphQL uh, allows the client to define the, the queries. Once again, thinking back to our uh, example request, the client told the server the exact data that it needs and following the GraphQL specification ensures that to a relative degree of uh, confidence that that's the data that it's going to get back. Uh, finally, it's backwards compatible. So I don't know that it works with floppy disks, but it, it does allow you to write code that serves the needs of clients that are consuming it today and allows you to make changes that uh, will fit the needs of the clients that you serve to down the road while still maintaining a structure that those legacy clients can consume without having to go back and change their code because all of a sudden, oh crap, our app doesn't work because so-and-so decided to change the back end. So uh, with Facebook uh, as an example, uh, you can see here uh, they uh, uh, have a, a minimum of 52 versions of their clients per platform clearing, querying their servers at any given time. So um, if, if you've done a lot of client server work, you know how challenging that can be. And, and I think if you've ever used Facebook's apps and whatnot, you you know that they're they're doing a pretty decent job of this, considering the the scale of that they operate at. Um, so finally, it's an application layer protocol. Uh, what that means is basically GraphQL operates on the the technologies that we already have at hand, specifically HTTP. So um, it doesn't require you to impl Im implement some new sort of protocol and able to get it working. You just make HTTP post requests to the GraphQL server and you get data back in JSON, just like you've kind of always done, but kind of in a new way. So uh, that, was, that was kind of the, the details of how, does, uh, how GraphQL is structured. Now we'll take a look at how exactly does it work. So. Uh, first, we're going to go to defining our types, and because we're in Ruby land, uh, let me bring this over. Uh, full disclaimer once again, I stole this library from uh, a guy named Robert, I believe it's Moss Olga, who uh, has written the Ruby implementation of GraphQL, and he built a little demo for us, and so uh, we'll take a look at the how he's defined the uh, schema in this example uh, Rails server and uh, using the GraphQL Ruby gem. So um, basically, every schema or every GraphQL server has a uh, base level schema type, and so that's what we're defining here: is that we have a Star Wars schema, and we're going to pass in a base query type. And so everything hits this base query type and defines uh, the, the types of objects that it needs out of that. Um, so if we go into, let's see. Uh, our types. So here's our, our base level query type. Um, got a little documentation on exactly uh, what an example query might look like, uh, and then uh, the actual definition of our query. Um, and so in this base level query, uh, we've got a couple different fields that you can hit. We've got a hero, we've got a human, we've got a droid, we've got a node, and 
to show you what all that looks like. I need to go back over here. And flip us over. So this is a tool called Graphical. And graph, Graphical is another part of the GraphQL library. And this is basically an API explorer for your GraphQL server. Um, and so uh, I forgot to mention that all of this great GraphQL API is all served up from basically one endpoint. So we've got this, this create request or this create action in our queries controller. And all of your queries are basically hitting this, this one action here with, with your queries. So you don't have to write 75 different controllers for all the objects in your system to define a bunch of different routes that are all really very similar. You write one route and it's going to serve up all this. So I know it's not much, but we can dive into this docs tool here and look at our query. And so this is the introspection part of GraphQL. So I didn't write any code to get this to work. It's just able to hit my one endpoint that I've got there and discover all this data or all this information about the data that's exposed within my API. So we can see our, our four base query points here, our hero, our human, our droid, and our node. And then we can dive into any of these things. We can see that this is a character type uh, and we can pass it an episode. Uh, we can also take a look at what the character type exposes. And so I believe this goes back to the, this is the strong typing part of things. And it's, it's not static in that the, the type is defined and then it is what it is. It's you have a, a character type and there's certain guarantees about this is the data you're gonna get and you're not gonna request a character with a name and instead of being a string, it's gonna be an array of all the different parts of their name. So I believe that's strong typing. Uh, if not, feel free to correct me. Um, but anyways, uh, you have the guarantees that in, if you request any of these things, they're going to uh, be returned to you if they exist. Um, so as an example, we'll write a query here based on our documentation. Uh, and so we want to get some data. Uh, we're gonna request a, uh, let's request a droid. And so as I start typing, it's got this nice little type ed tool, so it can tell me exactly what data is available in, in the particular structure that I'm defining. So you see here I type a droid, uh, and I've got to give it an ID. So it tells me I need an ID. I don't know what any of the IDs are. Uh, so that could be a problem. Do what? A one? <laughs> Good call. We'll see. Oops. So something went wrong, couldn't find a droid with ID1. So that's pretty convenient. That one didn't work, but hey, we get a really nice error message that tells us exactly what we needed to know about our system here. Uh, do what? I believe so. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna cheat real quick and I'm gonna go over to you. So this is Facebook's actual server. I wanted to show you that because that's the Ruby implementation. Facebook has this much more awesome Star Wars API here with like all kinds of stuff defined. And so we can come over here, but this one, this one is actually all defined in Node. And so I didn't want to show you that because this isn't the Node meetup. Um, but let's see, I think we can request, we'll just make it easy and we'll say we want all films and so you see there, I, I hit the all films query and it automatically, based on if you look in, uh, let's see, a film type, 
uh, where is our ID field? It's got this exclamation point to, next to it. This in, exclamation point is telling us that that's required data. It can't be null. And so it's automatically going to change our query to tell us that we have to request this specific data for the film. So now we've got an idea of what films are available. So we can take one of our IDs here and go back to our queries here. And uh, whoops. request uh, film. Request that specific film. And we can go over our, to our documentation, look at the film type, and see what kind of data we have available. So it gives us the ID, but I can say I want to get the title, and I want to get the producers of that film, and let's say the release date. Uh, and if you notice there, as I'm typing all this in, it's telling me exactly the format I'm going to get. So if I'm writing a, an Angular client that's going to consume some of this, like as I'm kind of exploring the AT API, I'm already getting an idea of exactly what data I'm going to get back so I can start to think about, okay, this is how I'm going to take that data and, you know, shove it into some HTML and display it to my users. Uh, so we do that. We hit it again. And uh, just like we... Uh, defined our query over here you can see the the data that's returned is in the exact same structure that we, we requested and so if you're like me and you write a lot of client-side code and a lot of server-side code like this is great like i'm i'm able to kind of make the 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 layer between those two pieces with very little effort at all now. So I, I can write this and it's exposed and, and this same endpoint can be used for various different clients and they can get the exact data out that they need. So this can be my general API as well and um, I don't need to change the structure of anything to make sure that um, that it fits the needs of these different clients that are consuming my API. Uh, so that's, I don't know about you guys, but that's, that's pretty, pretty fantastic. Uh, it is a different way of doing things than, than we have done. Uh, but I personally, I think it's, it's a huge improvement over the standard writing ways of writing APIs. So back to, this real quick. Go for it. I, I was holding off questions to the end because I gave this talk. Yeah, I, I gave this talk like a month ago in Birmingham and it went for an hour and a half because there were so many questions. And so I'm trying to like rush through this and make sure we hit all the kind of good stuff. Um, so hopefully, you know, you're kind of going mind blown. Maybe not, but I, I definitely was. Um, so we'll get to the resources here in a second, but uh, I want to go ahead and open it up to questions to make sure we got plenty of time to get to any of those. So Frank, start us hey, off. If you know me at all, I think you know it's going to be a security question. So, oh man. Okay, so a quick Google taught me that there's a thing called a query context. So instead of having a normal controller-based authentication, so say we have different users who have different roles, and we need to say, wait, 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 you're not authorized to use that role. I'm throwing the 403 uh, authorization required, and I'm throwing you in the penalty box, mister. Mm -hmm. um, do you do that at the query context? And the fact that we have but one endpoint now, does that mean that we now have to move all of our security logic into the GraphQL server since we no longer can use routing, you know, for different levels of, of roles there. Like right. slash admin must have a certain permission level or you don't even get past the Nginx server. Right. Um, so, so this yeah, becomes so, a single point of failure. Right. It becomes a universal query oracle for the entire database. Right, right. right. And this is, this is a, a 
somewhat contrived example. You can, by all means, have different endpoints. So you can, you can expose you know, a, a public API endpoint that would be somewhere else um, that, that might have some different uh, authentication layers on top of it. Uh, but a lot of that gets taken care of within your different queries. And I am by no means on the same level as you when it comes to security and probably to a fault. But <laughs> I'm more of the like, let's bang some stuff out and get some stuff done. And so. Right, right. And so um, what I was going to show you here, and this may or may not answer your question, uh, but basically in your different query definitions, you have this resolve hook. And that defines how your application actually pulls together whatever data it is that you need to return in your queries. And so this is one spot where you can introduce an additional layer of, layer of security to, to ensure, okay, this, you know, this request is coming from a user and they have a, an authentication token or whatever it is. And so they have access to the objects that I'm about to pull out of the database. And otherwise, you can return an error. Do it. Exactly. Yeah, so, so there, is, there is an entry point for some of that. Uh, I haven't dove too deep into the security implications of a lot of this, uh, and that's where I'm kind of relying on the fact that, hey, you know, Facebook built this, and surely they can build something more secure than I can. So uh, I'm, I'm somewhat relying on that, but I think it's also, uh, it does expose different ways, whether it's through having multiple uh, controllers for different clients or uh, using your resolve hooks to uh, do security in there as well. Uh, other questions? Anybody? Bueller? Yeah. You mentioned if it's hierarchy based or how possible is that hierarchy? So the query you may say, okay, I want the film, I want the title of the film, I want the producers of the film, I want the film, the title of the film, the producers of the film, and then the titles of all the films that those producers uh, did. Right. And all the actors that were national and then all the films that those actors were also. So you're playing six degrees from Kevin Bacon? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I find it fun. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's where it almost gets dangerous to a fault because it, it does allow you as the client side developer to develop this crazy nested query of this is all the data that I want uh, that I need and and diving six levels deep into the hierarchy to get this data and so you kind of have to be proactive to make sure that you're not kind of going through all that uh mess to try and get to things, but that's where it goes back to the strong typing system. Da, 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 da. Where's my stuff? From, from where'd you go? Oh, you're here. And so, so basically I can take this and I could, uh, as a contrived example, uh, I could take this, these producers and say, okay, uh, Let's see if I can do this on the fly here real quick. Uh, or let's see, film, what else do I have? Uh, where's like my species? Uh, actually, we'll do director. Uh, so I get my director. And I can say, okay, oh, that's not a, it's just a string. I want a, uh, not in that one. Let me get a species connection. And so it's going to return all of my species and, uh, Uh, 
but I can get uh, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. Dang, it might not work. Sorry, I'm trying to like think on the fly what I've got here. Uh, so this is a species, and I should be able to get. There we go. No, sorry, I don't know exactly which one of these I can use. Character, surely. Sorry. Anyways, before I fumble around this with this for half an hour, basically I could say, okay, I've got a film, and the film has these characters, and then I can say, okay, what films are these characters in, and then go back, and you could, you basically get yourself into an infinite loop with this stuff if you're not careful, because it's just going to keep looking up those types and using the resolve hooks, just like continually returning that data. So it's it's basically infinitely hierarchical. Uh, as long as you've got some sort of relation graph that you're traversing. Does that make sense? So if I can spam you with an infinite query, and I don't know, run 50 million of them once, yeah. is, is there like a, a DDoS vulnerability there? That... Potentially. <laughs> uh, once again, I think that goes back to to ensuring those things are taken care of on the server side, whether it's at the you know, Apache Nginx level or at the actual query level and, and limiting a query to, you know, kind of X, X length of characters or whatever. Um, there's different ways that you can handle that. I don't know of like a specific uh, implementation that you could use that's, that's going to be like the be all end all of like, we're never going to get attacked. I don't know that there is a be all end all of Security, I'm sure Frank <laughs> can attest to the fact that whatever you do, somebody's always going to find a way to exploit things. And so, yeah. Uh, so, are we good? Any other questions? Yep. Sorry, what? how do you define your entity connections? Uh-huh. Right, so let's get into... Uh, what do we have in here? Uh, here we go. So in the Ruby library, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So you have fields, uh, which return a specific type, and then you have connections. So pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, this is basically passing in a resolve hook right there that's, that's telling it what that how that connection is is defined um, so it's it's fairly straightforward and then let's see where's my interface so i'm i'm actually in this is a uh, self referential thing here uh, so there's uh, uh, another example, so this is implementing the, this is the droid type, and then it's inter, uh, implementing a connection that's using the character interface. And so it also has this idea of interfaces, which goes back to uh, kind of more strong typing standards and whatnot as far as being define this thing. And it's going to implement these attributes regardless of whether it's a droid or a human or uh, whatever else possibly is available in here. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yeah. Uh, that's something you probably don't want to get into. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, like I was uh, explaining here, is you can, because of the uh, dynamic nature of the, the queries that you submit, as long as there's some sort of connection between objects, you can you can kind of infinitely go down the nesting of okay, like as a contrived example, a 
you know, a character has many films, and a film has many characters, and the character has many films, and the film has many characters, and just keep going down that, uh, that rabbit hole of, of nesting between this relationship. Uh, and so it does potentially allow you to do that, which, you know, obviously wouldn't be a good thing, especially on limited clients like uh, mobile devices and whatnot. So it's something that it puts the onus on the client-side developer to be conscious of those things and make sure that they don't define their queries in a way that, that gets you into that mess. So, good. Anybody else? Questions? Awesome. Did anybody learn anything? Oh, another question. So we have a relational database currently. How, how easy is it to like, transfer or, or like, move over to a relational database and have your own? So this doesn't replace your database. This replaces your, uh, your layer between your web server and your, your client implementation. Uh, and so, so like with the, the Rails example here, there's still a, a Postgres database behind this example that's, that actually houses the data. This is just defining a different way to expose that data than the typical REST endpoint of hit the, you know, slash characters, slash ID, slash whatever, like, and then having to chain that with additional requests to get, you know, the relation, the relational data about that character. So the films that they're in, for example, you define that all in this one query, one post request to the server, you get the data that you expected back and you dump it into your Angular app or your iOS app or whatever the case is. That makes sense? Cool. Anybody else? Anybody learn anything? Anybody excited that, about this? Awesome. So real quick before I get out of here, uh, there are tons of resources out there. Um, a few of the ones that I used for this talk, graphql.org is the main site. The spec is at this uh, GitHub IO address and it's like I've read the whole thing and it's dry technical documentation of like how you actually implement a GraphQL server, but read it if you want, it's very insightful. Uh, this is the actual repo. There's a fantastic tutorial at learngraphql.com that's done by Kadira who do a lot of Meteor JS work uh, and they have built this little tutorial that go, walks you through setting up a GraphQL server and a client to consume it. Uh, and so that's great information. Uh, there is a Slack channel, which I believe is filling up quickly. So like get on there before it gets just too big that they have to shut it down or whatever it is they do. Uh, and then Awesome GraphQL is a GitHub library with like 10,000 resources about GraphQL. So uh, you can go there and find pretty much anything you need. Uh, libraries, right off the top of my head, there's Ruby, Node, Express, the graphical tool, which by the way, there's also a uh, graphical uh, Electron implementation. So Electron is the wrapper around like Atom, for example, I believe Slack as well. And, uh, and so basically you can uh, download a, a native client for your GraphQL implementation that you just spin up as a native app on your, your machine and you can fiddle around with your GraphQL endpoints. Uh, so that's out there as well. We hit questions. Uh, hopefully we're winning. Thank you guys so much. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.